Uh, I guess you're good. So every once in a while, I'm gonna walk over here and hit the button. All right, so let me. Let me be good. Should be fine. Yeah, I think she'll be good. People will see you on That's good. Your friend. We share the seat with your friend. No, it's mine. No sense. Okay. <laughs> All right. I don't think I need to. Sorry, the call. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sure. Hey guys, thanks again for coming. So we have a great talk today. So just a few announcements before we start. Uh, in a couple of weeks, I think we have a on, on 27th, it's a couple of weeks. We have another group made up of um, you know, um, operations, uh, subgroup operations made up, so you're more than welcome to join that as well. It's going to be at Cross Campus in Santa Monica. Uh, and in February, we have an HPS talk, and we have a Spark talk as well. Um, it's going to be just uh, check the mail page and see more information about that. All the information you need is all right over there. So, um, after, at the end of the week, uh, can you guys just put your chairs back together, put, put the chairs, put the, uh, put the tables and put the chairs around it? I think that will make Aaron very happy. And uh, I think today, Aaron mentioned uh, he wants to close up at 9. So, once the talk is over, we can start moving towards the end. That'll be good. Uh, we have some books and some uh, t shirts to give away. Uh, David, uh, how do you want to do that? Do you want to uh, raffle them off or do you want to ask some questions and at the end, you know, based on your talk or whatever? A raffle sounds good to me. Oh, you know, many people have questions on so It's a more interesting, doesn't it? Uh, <laughs> sure, I, I, I haven't played that exact game before, but uh, I mean, just based I, on I'm, I'm, are... I'm happy to play. All right, so David's going to ask you some questions uh, based on his uh, presentation today. So please pay careful attention. <laughs> If you want to win the books or the t-shirts. Yeah, that's... So without further ado, I hand over to David. David is coming down from the Bay Area. He works at Artists Care and is going to talk today about hive and the cloud and debugging issues when we face with hive. I think it's also useful if you have your own cluster because there are probably some tips you might give on how to optimize your hive queries on the cluster. I'm going to right, David? Thanks. All right. Yeah, thanks for coming out tonight. I'm going to try to get away without the microphone, if you don't mind. And um, what about the streaming people? Do you think they uh, I well, we're using the microphone um, over the streaming here. Hello, if anybody's. Um, I think it could. I think if should anybody's be. watching the streaming version of, of this. Are we all set? Yeah. Looks alright. Looks alright. Looks alright. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank, th thanks to Factual for hosting and Subash for coordinating. It's, um, I, I hope this is a fun event. I'm with a company called AltaScale based in Palo Alto, California, and I'll be talking about work uh, that was we did to, together actually in collaboration with, with our customers at AltaScale. But the folks at AltaScale were uh, Somacharya. He has a PhD from Cornell and is leading our um, applications engineering group. Um, Dennis is a performance expert who came to all to scale from Netflix and, and has certainly run things at scale. Um, Charles is a, a really interesting guy. He ran about um, 40,000 nodes of Hadoop at, at Yahoo when we were there. So he's really familiar with um, running big clusters. So uh, again, if you don't mind, it's a small ish crowd here about I guess 30 people for the in case anybody's listening to the recording so um, I'm hoping to make it a little more interactive feel free to ask questions in the middle if you have them let me ask some questions um, so how many of you are active users of Hadoop um, uh, how many of you consider yourself data scientists um, okay and and high Hive users in the audience? OK, so it looks like um, a little less than half. Um, how many of you ha um, are not Hadoop users? That should be OK. And, and how many of you are familiar with the history of Hadoop? 
Okay, again, about half of the, the audience. You, you know, I may um, take a little bit of time at the beginning then um, to give a little bit of the history of Hadoop and where it came from and, and how that kind of intersects with some of us from Alta scale. Um, so, the reason why I talk about Alta scale is it really colors the perspective that we have on um, how, how to run applications and when you run into problems with applications like Hive on Hadoop, um, what, to, what to do about that. So, so uh, oh, by the way, if you want a PDF version of this talk, I'll, I'll send that to Subhash um, uh, sometime over the next couple of days and he'll yeah, post we'll it on the Meetup site. Um, Right, so we run Hadoop as a service. So, so we build Hadoop clusters. We rack the hardware, we specify the nodes and the networks and, and um, make sure that it all works well. Um, we build networks uh, to get great connectivity with the internet in general and in particular, we've got a lot of customers who are using Amazon Web Services, so we have great connectivity into AWS on the West Coast and, and East Coast. Um, uh, the, most of our customers are using some combination of Hive, Pig, or Uzi on top of the cluster, and then um, others as needed. So ours, R and Python are kind of uh, favorite languages for data scientists, so they're using those tools. We've got a bunch of customers who are ramping up on Spark, and then um, uh, Marku, uh, machine learning on Hadoop, and We've got a couple or three customers using Impala. So there's a range of different platforms that people are using. And, and what we actually sell is compute and storage. So the compute is in terms of yarn containers. And I'll talk a little bit more about the Hadoop architecture and what that means. Um, and then storage, we, we tend to sell in units of about 10 terabytes of, of Hadoop distributed file system storage. Um, okay, so for this talk, I'll, I'll be talking a little bit more about Alta Scale to, so that you can get an idea of where we're coming from and our perspective. I'll talk about how many of you are Hadoop 2 users at, at this point? How many folks still um, using Hadoop 1? Okay, not too many. Really, nobody's still on Hadoop 1? Great. That's changed a lot over the last even even nine months. So I won't um, I, I I won't spend too much time talking about the differences between Hadoop one and two. Um, I'll talk about Hive, what is Hive, and and how it interacts with the Hadoop architecture, and then I'll go th um, through the details of what it feels like to work in this environment and then um, go through some case studies of problems that people run into with Hive, um, kind of the state of the art now for debugging those issues, and then in the future um, uh, give a perspective on where we'd like all of this to, to go. Um, so one of the factors when we're thinking about the Hadoop community in, in general is um, it's been moving very quickly, especially over the last couple of years. Um, most of our customers have made the transition over the last year um, from Hadoop 205 to 220 to, to, to 241, and it's really important to, to keep up with these versions because the functionality and efficiency of Hadoop um, <coughs> continues to improve with each one of these releases. So, so too with Hive. Um, one of the most interesting transitions that's happened here is that up through Hive 12, oh, okay, so Hive is SQL on top of Hadoop. And up through Hive 12, um, what Hive was doing was translating always, uh, almost always, SQL queries into MapReduce jobs. Uh, starting with Hive 13 and going forward, there's um, a, a new uh, underlying system for doing execution on Hadoop, which is called TEZ. Um, and it's, it's one of the growing number of alternatives to MapReduce. So starting with Hive, you, um, you can start running not just on MapReduce, on, on other frameworks that run on Hadoop. And our customers are, are, are seeing some good um, performance benefits from, from doing that. Um, so 
as I mentioned, we're also working with customers on, on a variety of different tools. And one of the points that I'm going to make, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go through a tour of kind of a lot of the guts of Hadoop and what it really feels like to use this kind of, kind of system. And one of the points that I'm trying to make is this is really not a great way for people to be spending their, their time. Um, and, and so one of the challenges that I've kind of been giving to the Hadoop community as a whole is can we please kind of raise the, the level that we're using these systems? And I think to a certain extent that's, that's happening in, in some pretty, um, pretty fundamental and very interesting, very interesting ways. So for example, with H2O, data scientists can, can li live within R or R Studio. Um, which is a tool that's very familiar, and use Hadoop on the back end, but they don't need to, to know that, it, that it's there. Um, and with some of these other tools, they, they um, like um, Trifecta, they get a similar experience. Okay, so our, our perspective. Um, why do we do what, what we do? Well, the, the idea is that our customers get performance and reliability, so I, I'm sorry. What's what's your name name with the name node shirt oh, over there? Douglas. And, okay, so so Douglas here is uh, is wearing a reference to the name node, which is the master of the Hadoop distributed file system. With pretty much any distribution of Hadoop you care to use, if the name node goes down, you're really in a, in a world of hurt. Um, when you're on Altus, one of our clusters, you open a support ticket, and we'll we'll just fix that for you. Um, uh, it's part of the value that we provide. Um, the, the other is the, the clusters are always on, so your data is all, always sitting there live to, to be analyzed on an as-needed basis. Like I said, we provide that Hadoop help desk, so it's not just about um, uh, service outages that folks might see. We get a constant flow of, of questions that we answer about why is Hadoop or why is High doing what it's, what it's, what it's doing. Um, it's secure. Um, we're in the middle of going for a SOC 2 audit, and as I mentioned to some of you, we're, we're, that will lead into PCI compliance and, and a bunch of the other certifications that you can get for, for any computing system, including Hadoop. Um, and then the, the results that we see is our, our customers are, are happy with us because um, they can really iterate a lot faster because they can focus on what is the data that I'm trying to analyze as opposed to why is Hadoop doing what it's, what it's doing or what it's not supposed to do. So all, all of this adds up to the fact that um, we at AltaScale and I in particular are um, uh, infrastructure nerds. So we do take an approach that, that really focuses on how is the system working and why is it working the, the way it's working. That, that will come out. So, so I won't be talking about, um, for example, how to optimize SQL queries. I'll be talking about, okay, what, what's going on in the underlying system when those queries are, are running. Okay, so a quick primer on the Hadoop um, architecture. So as I said, the, the name node is the master of the Hadoop distributed file system. Um, the resource manager is uh, the master of uh, YARN, which is essentially the, the scheduler for the computation of the system. Um, and then the secondary name node um, provides uh, uh, services to the name node, including keeping a copy of the data. So uh, the metadata for the Hadoop distributed file system. So if the name node goes out, the secondary name node is retaining the data, the data that is, that's required to restart the, the system. Um, and then there's kind of a sea of uh, node managers which provide compute and data node processes that, um, that provide storage. Okay, so then um, I, I don't really want to belabor this point, I, um, uh, um, but uh, again, it, it might be worth making sure that we're all talking the same language. So the resource manager of the cluster allocates um, what computation goes where. Um, the application manager is started for each job that's run. So for example, when you run a Hive query, 
somewhere in the cluster an application manager will start up. The application manager will talk to the resource manager to get the computation resource, resources that it needs. But it's the application manager that will sit there and make sure that the query runs to completion. And then the node manager runs on each of those slave nodes of the system um, to uh, actually take the requests from the application manager and to, to actually do the processing. Okay, I am going to skip the Hadoop 1 versus Hadoop slide because it seems like we're all moving along. Um, which is, like I say, which is great and indicates kind of the velocity that, that the whole um, community is moving along. Okay, so here are all of the tools that we can use to say what is the cluster doing and why is it doing it. So, um, there's some basic monitoring that, that can go in place that, that gets installed on each machine that can say what are the processors, memory, network, and disk doing. Um, there's sy the systems that gather that, it, gather that information and then roll that up into alerts and so forth, including Agios, Anglia, Sensu, um, uh, uh, Graphite will gather the metrics um, from uh, processes that are watching those machines like collect and stat. So these are all the kind of the, the fundamental metrics of what's going on on the, on the machines. What are the processors are doing? How much memory on each, uh, on each system is being used? How much network? How much risk? Then at the Hadoop level, um, you can see metrics like how much of the file system is being used um, and then the resource usage. So um, how much um, how much of the compute is being used, um, what are the number of jobs that are running, what, uh, what are the tasks that are running, how long do they run, and so forth. Um, and then there are the Hadoop logs themselves. So all of those processes, the name node, the resource manager, the secondary name node, the data nodes, um, and the node managers, they're all sending out their own logs. So. Um, so you have this, these clusters of uh, tens or hundreds or even thousands of machines, and they're all generating logs, which is kind of, like I said, we're infrastructure nerds. So while our, our customers tend to be uh, running Hadoop jobs that analyze what's going on in the real world, right? So they're getting web lo logs from web servers that are coming in or financial transactions that are coming in or... Uh, information about trucks that are in the field or, or whatever it is. So they're, they're analyzing things that are happening on the internet or, on, or, or in the real world. Um, then what that happens is it causes our Hadoop clusters to throw their own logs. So we at AltaScale are a customer kind of recursively of our own product. So we take all those logs from all those Hadoop clusters and put them on our own Hadoop cluster and do analysis on so that we can tell, okay, how are how are our customers doing and what are they doing and how can we provide better, better service to, to them. Um, and then at the end of the day, uh, when you're writing an application, a lot of that, that debug process is well instrument the source code of, of my application and be able to, to see what's going on at, at that level. Uh, a lot of these sources are, are pretty raw. And like I said, one of the main points that I'm going to keep making is we as a community really need to kind of up-level the conversation and get the, the, the debugging and analysis to happen at the level that, um, that data scientists are thinking as opposed to the level that the system is, is engineered. Um, for example, I, I mentioned that um, all of the machines uh, can, uh, can generate metrics. So for a cluster of tens or hundreds or thousands of, of machines, you can aggregate um, what's the processing load, how much memory is being used, um, disk usage, network usage, and, and, and so forth. And so uh, we do aggregate that up to the, to the cluster level. So our customers can select the date range for when their cluster was being used and see kind of in aggregate how much um, how much resources were they using at, at any time. Um, one of the things that I would really like to do is do this same kind of thing, but on a job-by-job -job basis. So it's not across my cluster, 
what was I doing? But for this specific job, for this period of time, how much processing memory network or disk um, was, I use, was I using? And that can start uh, helping me understand um, what are the real use resources that are getting used when I'm doing computation and how might I think about optimizing that. Um, although, uh, for some of our customers, especially in the proof of concept phase, they're, they're sometimes just running one big, one big job at a time. So this view can actually be um, pretty useful, especially during a proof of concept phase um, when you know pretty much which job you cared about and what time it was running and be able to, to look at the resources being used on the cluster at that time. Okay, so that's, that's kind of an overview of Hadoop and what are the pieces of Hadoop and what tools do we have. Are, are there any questions about that? so far? Um, okay, maybe I'll just dive into the, the next level deep, which is, what does it really feel like to you? Yeah, question? So the solution is you build it yourself, not based on open source. So the question is, do we all to scale build the Hadoop distribution ourselves? Yeah, yeah so we start with the, um, we start with the Apache, uh, version of Hadoop. Um, we tend to be close in version to Hortonworks, um, but we, we don't ride in lockstep with them, nor do we use their di distribution. If you want to see the exact version of Hadoop that, that we're using, it's, it's, it's very close to Apache, but we have a public GitHub repo on the Altascale organization. So if at any time you want to see what we're doing with with Hadoop, that, that's available via GitHub, as, as um, our Linux kernel, if you're interested, is, is also up there. Um, uh, and any changes that we make to Hadoop um, are posted as patches to uh, a JIRA in the Hadoop community. So the way Hadoop moves along is like a lot of projects these days where um, the, the uh, projects are managed in JIRA and the and the, and the issues are managed there too, and so any code changes we make, we, we publish to the community that way. Did that answer your question? Okay, thanks. Okay, so so the next level deeper here is what does it really feel like when you're when you're running Hive? So um, when you're at the prompt, you're essentially typing uh, Hive query language, which is um, a subset, although not a proper subset of of SQL, but it's it's very much a SQL dialect. So you're you're selecting rows from tables or ju doing joins between tables. It it, it 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 certainly has that feel, which is why a lot of our customers like like Hive because they're very familiar with um, SQL as as a language and, and the concepts involved. But after you run a query that starts uh, a MapReduce or a Tez job to find out, well, what's really going on, you wind up in the resource manager user interface. And that user interface um, lets you dig down to find out, okay, what is actually being run? So if there's some, for example, if there's some sort of bug in, in the system, um, whether it's a functional bug or a performance issue that you're, that you're tracking down, um, you, you wind up in this view, which is very different from that from that SQL level. So um, here's what the resource manager UI looks like. There's some um, there's some data about the cluster here um, in terms of the amount of memory that it has, the total amount of memory on this cluster. There it says that uh, 38,383 jobs have been been run on it. Um, that have run to completion successfully, uh, 20 are currently running, and uh, slightly more than, than that have been submitted to the cluster. Um, then there's a number of lines here. Each of these lines is a job that's running on, on the cluster, and I, um, I blew up the job, the description of the job that I'm running, which has this application ID number, which is a link, and then my name, because I ran the job, and then it shows uh, the query that I ran, or at least a portion of the SQL query that I ran. So this is a very simple 
select half star from um, from a from a table. And the stage minus one uh, is appended by pi because queries can be scheduled into multiple jobs. Um, so each job will be a different stage of that query execution. Um, is everybody with me so far? We're running SQL. We're trying to leverage tens, hundreds, thousands of machines to, to run that SQL. And, and now we're at the point where we're running a query and we want to know what's going on. Well, you're not running the UI, the source manager. Um, on the notes that you are showing, which one hosts the resource manager? So the question is, of the, of the notes, which one is running the resource manager UI? Um, so in the clusters that, that we build, we have essentially a sea of nodes that, have, that are appropriate for storage and compute. So they have a lot of processing ability, a lot of disk, um, uh, 10 gigabit per second network, um, uh, and, uh, and and a lot of memory on them too, especially for our customers that are running in Color or Spark with the, the memory intensive systems. We have separate nodes that are essentially handling metadata, so the, so that includes the name node, the secondary name node, and the resource manager. Those run on um, different node types, which are have less CPU, less memory, less network, less disk, because they require, um, they require uh, just fewer resources than the main compute or storage nodes. Um, so for each of our clusters, we have three of these nodes, separate kind of light nodes designated. So the resource manager is running on one of those nodes. To figure out which node it is, um, uh, AltaScale provides to our customers a service called portal.altascale.com. It's kind of, it's, it, it would be familiar to you if, if you use Amazon Web Services, although their portal is a lot bigger and has a lot more services in it, but it has this same kind of feel with user management and cluster management. And in there, you log, so if you're one of our customers, you log into that and it says, Here's the link to click on to get your resource. Oh, really did. Did I somewhere in there answer your question? I hope. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. Sure. So, what do customers buy from you? So, customers buy monthly packages of compute and storage from us. So, um, yeah. So, so this, so the storage here, it's it's actually in a different different interface, but that's easy to describe. So they buy tens of terabytes of storage from, from us. Okay. And we charge for that on a monthly basis. The, the detail, if you care, is we, for I think all of our customers, well, for many of our customers, we bill net 30. So we send the bill out at the beginning of the month, then they use the service, and then net 30, meaning 30 days later, they, they pay us for, for the service. So they know up front exactly what they're going to need. And then computation, so, so what you hand to the resource manager is essentially a bunch of containers. And those containers can do a certain amount of computation and have a certain amount of memory associated with them. So we sell in increments of tens of thousands of container hours or task, task hours. So it's, it's essentially one of those units of work multiplied by an hour multiplied by 10,000, although when we actually calculate how much our customers use, um, we use our Hadoop cluster to do that. So if you do this on Amazon, if you use one minute, they'll charge you for an hour. If you use two minutes, they'll charge you for an hour. That's not so with, with AltaScale. We provide reporting, so if you use a container for 10 minutes and 35 seconds, that's what goes into our aggregation. Did that answer mm -hmm. your question? Okay. Um, okay, so you're in the resource manager interface and you're running an application. To get more information about the application, you click on that link. Here's what happens when you click on that link. Um, again, it says, I'm the one who ran it, uh, shows the query again, says that when I was running it, it was a MapReduce job as opposed to a Pez job. Um, and then uh, it gives me a couple of ways to dig down into, okay, but what did the job actually do? There's this logs link over here, which gives an application level view. 
Um, and then there's a history link, which tends, it, I, I think it's up here because it tends to be more um, relevant and, and useful. So I will first show you what happens when you click on the logs link, and then what happens on the history link. So when you click on that logs link, you get the log that comes out of that application manager, um, which is which essentially says which task started up, um, and, and when, and, and where did it start. Um, the thing that I find more useful is that history link, because the history link says how many mappers were started as part of the job, how many, and how many reducers. And then again, I can go into, um, if I want to know what was happening, and, and now we're getting into the actual computation of this run, I can, I can click on, mm -hmm. for example, one of these mapper links. And when I click on that, I can see, okay, what were the mappers that were run as part of the job? And then I can click again, um, say, on that mapper link to get down to the actual task that was run. Um, and then I can click on this logs link here uh, to get to the, to, to get to the other to, to get to the log of the actual computation that was being done. And so um, it's kind of rinse and repeat for those of you, uh, for those of us who use Hive on a day-to-day -day basis, we wind up going up and down through the stack far more than, than we, we like and uh, sometimes get uh, a little slap happy as we're doing that. Um, uh, but that, that's, that's at least part of the, the game now of, of using these kinds of systems. And I'll show some of the uh, things that we found in these logs and why they're important. Okay, so another word, another word about how Hive itself works. Um, so there are a few ways to drive Hive, starting with Hive 10. There's the Hive command line interface. And then um, that goes directly to the Hive data store service. Um, there's also a kind of sidecar called Hive Server um, that takes uh, JDBC or ODBC connections um, and programs like Tableau or Kettle can access Hive by using those connections. It's the Hive Meta Store that then will generate the, the jobs like I was showing that, that run on the, on the Hadoop <coughs> cluster. So um, I think our a lot of our customers on a day-to-day -day basis are using the command line interface, but more and more, and this is something that I think is really positive, people are sticking with these kinds of interfaces. And Tableau and Kettle are some of the legacy interfaces. There are some really new up-and-coming interfaces that, that are um, graphical interfaces for browsing data and so forth that, that, that we're starting to trial with some of our, our customers that are really kind of at least raising some of the, the level of some of the day-to-day -day tasks. But at the end of the day, um, there, there are still some subtle issues, like the ones that I'll talk about, that, um, that, that crop up over time. So I talked about the Hadoop logs um, kind of uh, um, in addition to those Hadoop logs. There are also logs that are generated by all of these different components components of, of Hive. So um, they're the logs that are generated by the client itself. And for reference in this talk, I, I've listed where the configuration is that tells you where these, where these logs are. Um, so there's, uh, there's the client logs. So this is on, on a query by query basis. Um, what, what's, um, what's being performed by Hive? And that previous one is when you run it, when when you actually run a query, where do the logs go? The Hive Meta Store itself, as it's generating the queries and 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 deciding what jobs to run, it also generates information um, in in the in the form of logs. So all of these can be useful for for digging in and understanding different um, problems that that you can run into. Um, when running Hive. So I'll talk about uh, a few of them. Um, kind of, I'll start with a few systematic issues like uh, 
uh, when we run out of memory um, or run out of processing. And then I'll, I've got a few case studies um, of, of issues that customers have sent to us that kind of get into how is the system working end to end and um, what are what are our customers talking to us as as the, about as they use the system? The thing that I really want to get to that um, has a lot of interest these days is for people who are running Hive and want to use one of the newer systems like Spark or Impala or H2O or any of these newer systems that are um, pretty DRAM intensive systems. Um, Getting Hive to run on exactly the same cluster as, as these other uh, DRAM intensive systems requires some, some careful tuning that I'll, that I'll talk about. So, um, okay, so digging into the kinds of things that, that can happen. So, and, and, and really, uh, again, most people want to write SQL who are using Hive want to write SQL queries and have them be executed efficiently and give the responses that, 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 they, that they need to be able to understand their data. So it's kind of a rude shot when you run a SQL query and you get a long Java stack trace that says somewhere in the middle of it, uh, out of memory error Java deep space. Um, and we, we get that most often with our customers that are using a technique called map side join. So if you're, if you're running a SQL query that's a join that's uh, taking a really large table, say uh, a terabyte or tens of terabytes or even a hundred terabytes, and it's joining it against a table that's much smaller that can fit in memory. Let's say a table that's just a, a few a gigabyte or a few tens of gigabytes. Um, then what you want to do is a map side join, which is essentially take, taking that table, loading it into the memory of the machine that's running the mapper, and just uh, doing lookups in that table as you're scanning through the much much longer table. The, the issue with that from an operational perspective, um, with Hive at least, is that when it starts the job up, it really wants that table to fit in memory not just on these computation nodes, but on whatever machine is actually starting the, uh, starting the job. So, um, so we, from time to time, we have our customers open a support ticket and say, hey, I'm running into, into this problem. And the answer a lot of the time is that they're doing one of these map side joins. And so the solution for that is um, when you're running the command line interface, then um, in the environment, um, so we're talking the uh, actual command line prompt um, or the script that's, that's running the system, the environment needs to set Hadoop deep size to a size that's large enough to, to contain that table. Um, uh, of course, there, there are some things that can get in the way of that. One is, does your machine actually have enough memory um, whether it's a virtual machine on, on Amazon or OpenStack or a physical machine, you do need to look at, okay, how much actual DRAM do I have on, on that machine? Um, the other thing is, is very subtle. At, at least through the current version of Hadoop 2, the scripts that internally run all of these tools are kind of a mess. So one thing I'm proud to say is that we have a, a, a an engineer named Alan Wittenauer, who's working at AltaScale, and one of the things he's done is he's done a, uh, uh, an, he's rewritten all of those scripts that essentially start up the Hive processes, and he's got that committed back to the trunk of Hadoop, which is um, at least right now called Hadoop three. So there's, um, so there's uh, uh, a future out there where a lot of this will will be cleaned up and easier to deal with, but the, the problem is with some of these scripts, if, if you set this um, Hive or some combination of Hive and the Hadoop scripts that, that start Hive um, might just ignore what you're trying to tell it. So um, uh, 
it, it's just, uh, again, it's, it's one of these areas where we're working to make all of these tools better so that people don't have to worry about the issues. But right now, the state of the art is you do have to worry about, OK, on the machine that's launching the jobs, how much memory do I have? And how do I configure the, the processes I'm running to have an appropriate amount of memory? Is there a way to calculate the Hadoop heap size, or do you have to just do it by trial and error? So the question is, is there a way to calculate the Hadoop heap size, or you have to do it by trial and, and error? I'm repeating, especially for the folks uh, who are watching the recording. Um, so, and this is actually on my conclusion slide, so I'll get through it quicker. Hadoop is written in Java, and Hive is written in Java. And, and so the, the root of this is when you run a Java application, you need to specify the heap size for the Java application, because that's essentially the container, if you will, that it uses. Um, and then when you start running out of memory, it has this great feature called garbage collection, which is awesome unless you really need more memory than, than you can figure. So Hadoop has inherited from Java the requirement to analyze in advance your memory size and set the memory size uh, appropriately. And, and that's a good thing from the perspective, from kind of a computer systems engineering kind of perspective. Well, you ought to know how much memory your, your process is, is going to use. But from the perspective of a data scientist, I, I, one of my favorite quotes from a uh, data scientist at, at one of our customers, who's, she's just a genius, but she says, I don't know Java. I don't want to have to know, know Java, right? My, my job is to be a status, statistician, right? So we're kind of at this, we're, we're kind of getting some friction at this point between the computer scientists who know how to build these big distributed systems and the data scientists who are really focused on, on the tasks that they're trying to get done. So the answer is some of them. In this question, what we need to tell our customers is, if you are doing a map side join, that map side join needs to fit in memory. So as, look, even as a data scientist, you should know approximately how big this table is that, 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 that you're using. That's, that, that is one of the things that, that um, I, I think is an acceptable requirement. So then, in this case, then you have to kind of tell the system the, the size and shape of, of the data that you're using. And will that influence the, the uh, heap size of the, uh, of the virtual machines running on each node itself, or does it operate on some other level? Um, so the question is, will that influence the um, memory size of the virtual machines that are running on each node? That, that's a really subtle question. I, for most of the Hadoop that I, systems that I've seen, if you're running on virtual machines, like if you're on AWS, you better pick your instance sizes right, or, or you're kind of out of luck. Um, at Alta Scale, we're taking a different approach. We're actually um, we haven't we are in the middle of this process right now, but we're virtualizing user using Docker containers, which are a little more flexible from the perspective of it takes a few minutes to start up a virtual machine versus um, much less than a second to start a Docker con container. Um, so. So we are just getting into the, the part of the process where we can start thinking about sizing these containers appropriately for specific customers or specific jobs. But it's, that's, that's just a very hard question that, that you're asking, which most people in the Hadoop world, just, you just have to kind of deal with it. Yeah, another question? How does uh, running R actually affect the memory? Because R is... The question is, how does running R uh, affects the, the memory. How many of you are R users? I just want to know how to spend, how much time <laughs> to spend on it. So maybe a quarter. Uh, okay. So R is a language that is very popular with data scientists. It's open source. It's a uh, language by and for statisticians, um, uh, which, and, um, and so kind of a whole generation of statisticians have been trained uh, to use R. So the, the typical way to use R is to get a machine with uh, more memory than the data set that you're trying to analyze. Epsilon, 
more memory than the data set, so you can be cost uh, cost efficient. Mm -hmm. And load it all up into DRAM on a single machine and be happy. Um, and up till very recently, once you uh, once your data set exceeds the size of the memory of a single machine, you're very unhappy running R. So there are a number of approaches to solving that problem. The one that maybe I like the most is from a company that was called Hexadata and recently got funding and renamed themselves H2O, which is the oh, same okay. as their product name, H2O. H2O. So I've, I've been doing a lot of talking about Hive, which takes SQL and runs right. MapReduce jobs or now Tez jobs that, uh, that that execute those SQL queries. H2O is kind of the, kind of the same thing for R, okay. where you can sit in R Studio, and um, H2O is actually public source. Okay. Um, but but getting it all set up and being able to run it on a Hadoop <laughs> cluster, there's a lot of fiddling that you need to do, unless you're on Alta scale, in which case we do that for you. But okay. it, but anyway, H2O is kind of the equivalent of Hive in the sense that it will. Um, it will um, generate the map reduce. Sorry, it won't. It will. It actually run. It, it's slightly different in the sense that it runs its own execution engine. Okay. And so the the way H two O works is it loads up the whole data set into the memory of a lot of machines, okay. and then runs and then figures out how to parallelize the the R algorithms. Mm -hmm. Machine, uh, well, the, whatever alg algorithms you're running, they've got a set of a lot of the most common R, R statistical algorithms, figures out how to parallelize it and executes that in parallel. Okay. So at the end of this talk, I will talk about some of the issues with, with okay. doing that. So we, um, but we've got a customer that, so we've really enjoyed working with the H2O team at AltaScale hmm. in support of, of some of our customers. Okay. And, um, and uh, they so what it feels like is you're in R, but you have this back, you have this engine backing it that's phenomenally power, uh, powerful, and and that seems to be playing pretty well with the data scientists who, who like using R. Good to know. So as as infrastructure nerds, we're kind of um, uh, agnostic about what the language is. A lot of people want SQL, we're happy to support SQL. A lot of, a lot of people want R, happy to support that. Python, up and coming is Spark. We're, we're good with all of this, which by the way is the benefit of Hadoop 2. The reason, I hope, why everybody's gone from Hadoop 1 to 2 so quickly is Hadoop 1 was, Hadoop 1 executes MapReduce full stop, you write MapReduce um, uh, applications, or run Map MapReduce uh, jobs on it. Hadoop 2 is closer to a proper operating system in the sense that you can run MapReduce or H2O or Tez or Spark or whatever on, on top of it. So it's a real evolution. It's kind of like when the iPhone went from not having third-party apps to having third-party apps, if you remember that yeah, transition. At first it came <laughs> out with just a few apps from, from Apple. And we loved it because it was different from everything else, but the, the apps really made the iPhone what the iPhone is to yeah. today. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm going to um, not belabor the point. There are a number of these different kinds of out-of-memory issues. One of them, th this one is um, the Hive tasks running out-of-memory on the cluster, which is when you start digging into the uh, the, the the application and then the mapper logs. But I, I want to get into at least some of the use cases of um, uh, what are our customers asking us and, and what are what's the experience of our customers, um, the kinds of things that, 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 that we see. And, and the, the, the reason why I keep referring back to AltaScale and what we're seeing is because we're, what I, what I hope that I'm doing is kind of aggregating the experience over all of our customers and kind of pointing out some interesting things that we've seen to you over a number of different companies who are all using uh, our service. Okay, so here's an example. Um, we had a customer that, that came to us and said, um, they gave us a job ID and said, it's been running for 41 hours. Can you have a look and tell us, you, you know, what, what's going on? Uh, is, is this thing ever going to co complete, you know, as Hadoop experts, um, uh, 
what as as Hadoop experts, can, can you dig into to this and figure it out? And I actually wrote a blog about this. And again, the the point of the blog was it shouldn't be this hard, right? So I so remember that process I showed of clicking down all the way through the logs and getting down to the bottom of what's going on. I, I actually did that for this job that a customer was asking about. And all the way down at that bottom of that tortuous thing that I already took you through, so I won't do it again, I found a Java stack trace. And buried on the 16th line of that stack trace was this line that said, file does not exist, HDFS colon slash slash, and then I redacted the name to protect the, the innocent here. And then it said, here's the file name, right? So if our customer had been able to do it, moreover, what I saw is um, the system was hitting this error, and then it would restart the, the same task, and the task would hit that error again, and it would just go over and over and over and over again. Um, so, so it was restarting the mapper over and over again, so we knew it would complete. But the point was, we actually got a file name, and we sent that file name back to the essentially the users group at our customer. And one of the colleagues of our customer said, oh, yeah, I, I, I know about that file because sometime over the last day, I, I realized there was some corrupted data in one of the tables, so I deleted it. Oh, no. And no. that deletion happened after the job started. So the, so the Hive Meta Store said, you, Hadoop cluster, must process these files. And if Hadoop is good at anything, it's retry, It's good at retrying <laughs> failures, right? Because that, that's why we like Hadoop. It's redundant. It retries tasks that fail. But in this case, it was just, you, you know, I talk about stupid robots a lot of, at, at work. Sometimes robots are just done, and if they're done, in this case, it didn't, it didn't do the, the right thing. So the interesting thing is that information all the way at the bottom, the information that our customer needed was, was actually there. The issue is that it wasn't propagated back up the stack to essentially the user interface that our customer was using to say, hey, this file doesn't, doesn't exist. It was buried down through that 12-step process. So in addition to providing these nice user interfaces that are that are coming along, it, this is kind of where we computer engineers and data scientists really need to find some common ground because what we need to do is figure out how to resurface these kinds of errors all the way up um, to, to say, hey, there, we expected to find, the system expected to find rows of this table in, in this file name and things aren't working be, because, of, because of that. Um, Okay, so, so so that was one. Um, let me let me skip through this one. Although I'll tell you the punchline uh, of 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 this one, the missing directories. Um, so it was essentially a customer. It, it was essentially a customer of ours that came and said, "Our data disappeared. What happened to our data?" Um, and we went in and did the log analysis. And, it, and it's pretty cool that these logs e exist, but uh, eventually we found approximately three hours separated in time um, a statement that said create database, um, and then this, this was the name of the database and gave the location of it. And then three hours later, they dropped the database. And if you read the Hive documentation really, really, really carefully, you'll find that that is uh, functionally equivalent to uh, R and dash R of the, of the database. Um, depends on how. how it, it's always like that. Yeah. It depends on it depends on where that database is on the file system and whether it's mm -hmm. in the Hive where, warehouse and a and a bunch of other and a bunch of other things. But it, yeah, ab, ab, absolutely. Um, so, 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 just be aware that there are these subtle cases in the in the middle of of we'll, Hive. We'll be leaving there, dropping the meta store. Yeah? Uh, sorry, there was a question about there, the meta store. 
they believe that by dropping the database, they'll delete the meta store. On the so, so it turns out that if you, s y yes, they believe that they were deleting the metadata, but no, not the under, but not the underlying data. Um, so, so okay, so. Since you seem interested in this, there, there's, there were some cascading decisions. So one thing that we did is we ensured that the Hadoop, tra after this event, we ensured that the Hadoop trash feature was on, um, which meant means that instead, it's like the trash can on your Mac or the recycle bin on your Windows machine. The, the data doesn't actually go right away. It goes into some container, and then it disappears after a configurable amount of time. That was great for customers who might unintentionally lose data. But for our other customers, um, when you're running long Hive jobs and a whole pipeline of Hive jobs, then you don't want the intermediate data to stack up um, in, in, the, in a trash bin. And so we found that some of our customers, after we decided to help the situation, were filling up their whole HDFS with trash. And so for a while, it, um, I, I was actually personally taking the trash out for, the, for this customer every <laughs> once in a while. Since then, we've gotten a feature back into Hive that allows you essentially to tell Hive to skip trash for certain queries. So if you, if you know what you're doing, and you run the same jobs every day, and you know that data stacks up in the middle of them, there's now a feature in Hive where you can say, OK, look, I, I know what I'm doing. Don't, when I drop this table, just skip the trash, uh, to delete the metadata, and move on. OK. Um, so yeah, yeah so, so that, was, that, was kind of, that was kind of an interesting interaction where one customer's needs um, kind of conflicted with other customers' needs. And, and we really, it, it, it took a while for the community to understand why we were proposing this as, as a change to, to Hive. Did I see a question? Yep. About your previous example, when you talked about the exception, yeah. that you only saw it on the data node log, basically. Yeah. There are cases in Hive that that does propagate up, and when you run the command, you actually see an error yeah. back on you. So that, I guess it's just that some, in some cases it's not as clear enough. Right. So, so, the, so the comment is that there are cases where that error does properly get propagated up. Um, three, com three comments about that. One, one that you made is sometimes it's not. We need to make sure it is. The second, and, and I, I'm trying to get this across to the Hadoop and specifically the Java development community, but my view is that a Java stack trace is never an appropriate error message <laughs> going to a, to a user. It needs to be refined into something that, um, that uh, a data scientist can understand. And, and then the third is, it's going to become even more of a challenge because now we're starting to deploy these graphical user interfaces for slicing and dicing through tables and so forth. So it was a hard enough problem to get those errors to propagate up to the command line version, which, as, as you point out correctly, it sometimes does, does right. But um, now we're going to need to figure out how to get that all the way. What, what would be really cool is in the graphical viewer to be able to say, OK, I'm processing this table, and 99.9% .9 of it is OK, but 0.1% um, uh, uh, of it is bad, and here's some samples. Here's the location of the bad samples, and here's some examples of them, right? Uh, yeah? So uh, skip version of the feature of the Oh, so Subash says skip trash has been a feature of HDFS for a very long time. Just so. Um, this integrated it essentially into the drop table um, so that you can drop a table and skip trash. And, and getting, that dove, getting that to happen at the hive level for um, some tables but not other tables um, is, is the feature here. So, so what we have, and, and again, this did confuse the community, but we, what we find is that our customers who are power hive users, they really want to specify this on a table by table basis because they don't want to drop their source data set by mistake, and they don't want to drop the results by mistake, but they want to drop 
typically all of the intermediate results are along the way, or they often often do. Does that make sense? Okay. So what was called the cache configuration? I think you mentioned that or some of the cache files are not being monitored, but there is a you know setting and reports. Yes. So so the question. Right. So Subash asks. Um, Hey, there's a configuration for when the trash gets dropped, right? But, but again, that's kind of subtle, right? The longer you set that, the less chance that you're going to lose data. And the shorter you set that, the, the less storage you use for trash, but um, the less time that you have to realize that, that you made a mistake. So we originally set that to, based on our, our experience, to three working days. Um, on the theory that if you do something by mistake on Friday afternoon, you can catch it by the next working day, which is Monday. And that works more or less well for most of our customers, but sometimes um, we need to tune it down. Although the skip trash option, I think, may get us back to three days as kind of what we use for everybody. Skip the, again, that's skip trash for Hive. And if you want to see the details in a very long conversation, the JIRA is Hive 6469. Yeah. Do you use the snapshots? The question is, do we use snapshots? We are not yet making heavy use of the snapshotting capabilities. But it would be interesting, maybe uh, after the talk, to talk about what that might be used for and what you're thinking in there. Um, Okay, let me um, just skip to this one because it's it's pretty topical, uh, especially across um, Spark feels like it's the latest hotness and everybody's talking about it. But but really, a lot of our experience here came from H two O. I thought I'd change that. Hexadata changed their name to H H two O. But I think that this is relevant to whether you're run, when you're running any DRAM intensive system. And that may include some of the streaming systems like Storm or Data, Data Torn. So the so the main thing that as as I as I mentioned before, Spark is very much like this H two O thing that I was talking about, where you want to load up as much data to memory as possible. Essentially, you want to take over the whole node's worth uh, of memory. And H two O, the way it runs, it will do that. It'll say, "My my mine, I'm going to take all the memory I can possibly get because that's what our Wants, wants to do. So here's what, here's what we found when doing that. So let's say this is your Hadoop cluster, and each one of these circles is a compute node. Um, and let's say you have three job queues. In this case, this job queue has two jobs in it, and each of those jobs is requesting four containers. And this is intentional. The size of these containers is exactly the same size as, as these nodes. This queue has uh, six, uh, has one job requesting six of the same size container. This queue has one job requesting eight of the same size containers. And for these, for these job requests and this size cluster, this is very easy to allocate. I find nodes for each of these for each of these containers. So this is this is you can think of it as a map or a reducer, but it, it's it's essentially an H two O task or or one of, the, um, one of the containers that's going to run um, an instance of Spark or one of these systems. So they just get, it, it, this is very easy to allocate. So do a capacity scheduler? Yes, we use a capacity, correct. We use a capacity scheduler. Um, and to, uh, to get these systems to run, we needed to increase the yarn container memory size. The, the typical container size is around, de depending mappers, we typically set at 1.5 gigabytes. Reducers, we set at 2.5 gigabytes. But for, for these systems, it can go to 48 gigabytes, 64 gigabytes, 128, 256 gigabytes. What are, are, these are memory hungry systems and essentially will eat as much DRAM as you can throw at them. It's kind of awesome. So the problem happens. Um, when you're running Hive. So this is kind of what a Hive job looks like, where it's a single job, and let's say that's the highest priority queue, and, um, and it's running a bazillion little tasks. And the problem that we found is when we, 
when we said to the resource manager, hey, you can, you've got this much memory av uh, available, what happened is it said, great, I'm going to take all of these high tasks that only require a small amount of memory each and pounded them into the same physical machine and, and kind of exploded the machine. Is that smoke coming out there? Uh, <laughs> yes, that is red tasks. <laughs> Uh, kind of using and making red smoke coming out. That that didn't act, that's conceptual. That didn't actually happen. Um, it was a, really a simple matter of uh, of restarting the node managers, and, and it came back up just fine. No no actual computers were hurt here. Um, but the point is, we did need to tell the capacity schedule scheduler to allocate both on the basis of compute and based on the uh, and on the basis of memory to essentially be co-scheduling and make that all work. Yep, Subash? Five minutes. Yes, I will be done in five minutes. Okay, so so the pro so another problem, here's the next problem that happens. So let's say you can get that Hive job running well by carefully tuning the scheduler. But let's say the Hive job is high priority. Then the, si the next situation we saw was, let's say this is an H2O job and this is a Spark job. What we saw is the H2O job would get some of the nodes that it needed, but not all of the nodes that, that it needed. And, um, and uh, this other job requiring big containers, again, it gets some of the nodes that it needed, but not all. And the way these systems run is it's kind of all or nothing. They, wanna, they, they want all of their nodes or none of it, because giving them a few nodes it, um, doesn't do any good. So, the state of the art here for Hadoop is there are two bad choices for how to, how to deal with that, and then um, a good choice, but it's in development. So the bad choice is, well, run these interactive jobs before running your Hive jobs. So for example, one, one thing that uh, our customers can do that are do, using both uh, H2O or Spark and Hive is they can start their H2O or their Spark system up and then run their Hive jobs. And because these nodes are already allocated, then, um, then the Hive job will, will fill in for, for the other nodes. Um, they can, uh, another way to do it is to say, OK, well, these things don't actually need to be quite so big and, um, and make the job of the scheduler a little easier. What's coming, though, is uh, the combination of two different um, two different features. And I, I just realized, I think I'm going to need to go back and get these JIRAs, the, the YARN 2492 and 726 exactly right. The, the community's been kind of changing the way that they've been doing that work over the last couple of months. But essentially what you want to do is you want to label some of these nodes as being the big memory nodes. And then you want to be able to do gain scheduling, which is essentially say to um, be able to tag these jobs as all or nothing kinds of jobs. I, I need this one. This one will be able to indicate uh, to the resource manager. I need six six full size containers, and don't bother to start me uh, unless you can give one to me. This one will say I need eight full size containers. Don't bother to start me un until you've got that ready. For me. Isn't this more like uh, possibly how we run with this lot? Is it is this more like Hadoop one, which had mapper slots and reduce slots? I, I hope not, because what so so yes, this uh, right this bad. Um, oh, I see. When with node labels, are you are you saying? Because uh, um, you say you reuse the containers. Yeah, the yeah. So we need we need to be careful to mm -hmm. to make sure that we don't make that hard separation like we had with mappers and. And Hadoop one. I mean, these are these are um, mechanisms that are in development, but we're pretty sure we'll be able to use them, to, them in combination to provide a better ex uh, experience for our, our customers. Let me come back to your question. Let me just do the conclusions, be officially done with the talk on time, <laughs> and then I'll then I'll come back. Okay. So uh, conclusions. Um, I've I've talked a lot through the talk about this one, which is we really need to kind of up-level this, um, the, the way that especially data scientists interact with, with the systems that, that we're building and providing to our customers. I talked earlier about the, the 
in response to your question about the static partition thing that's induced by Java virtual machines. Um, but there's, we as uh, system providers like these kinds of challenges. Uh, room for improvement means there's, there's just opportunity for adding uh, value. We're, we're seeing that Yarn, while promising to be an operating system that you can run a lot of applications on top of, it's not quite there yet, but we're working together to, to make it make it better. Um, uh, as a company, we're trying to aggregate the experience over all of our customers and, and share that with the community in, in uh, venues like this. Um, and then there's, there's another part of it, which I really didn't dig into, but I, I think I mentioned earlier that um, Hive 13 and onward have been a real collaboration between Microsoft and, and Hortonworks. And that's been really good to see because the, especially Microsoft has taken some of the, their long-term talent who really understand databases and have been contributing that to the open source community. So that, that's kind of phenomenal to see that, the that that's one of the many things that the community is doing and that's resulting in, in technology that's increasingly better for us, uh, all of us to use. It really gives me hope that over time we're going to be able to up-level all of these kinds of systems and really make them a lot more productive and easy to deal with. So that's all I had. Uh, again, thanks to Factual for hosting and Subash, it looks like you want to close. I'm, I'm happy uh, no. to... Give away, no, give away, give, give away. away. You oh, ask questions. Renee. Okay, so the first question is over here then. Okay, so the question is, why can't you divide your cluster in two and put one kind of jobs on one? Well, one kind of job is priority for one kind of job. That interface on one kind of job. Right, right. So I think I have a feeling that the direction that you're going <coughs> with designating different kinds of, of nodes and, and having essentially a smarter scheduler is what we're intending to do with the node labels, where, where, um, where we, we, set, we set some nodes aside, where the, the larger containers will have a higher priority for those nodes. We just need to be careful about that, because um, I mean, you have a difference in time, right? Because your ice cells usually run more than the system. So, 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 right. So, that's a, that, so your, your point is, but the hot jobs usually run pretty quickly, so it should be easy to, to get that scheduling. Right. That's what we that's what we really hope. One of the issues that we see is sometimes hive jobs, hive mappers or reducers just run forever um, because of the way a query has been written, or perhaps because of a very complicated um, user-defined function that's that, that that's in hive. So that's almost all, always the case. But not always the, the case. And you know, kind of going back to you know, twenty-ish years in time, there were these things called cooperative multitasking systems, where you kind of said, well, system, the programs running will will try to be good about giving each other resources um, uh, in a timely fashion. It, it, but but what we learned is bad actors can have kind of a cascading effect on the system. So I think. Another thing that's going to have to come along is the ability to preempt work and schedulers that are smart about saying, oh, "Okay, I'm, I'm running this. I'm running this hive job, but I've got this other thing that needs um, that, that has priority for certain nodes in the system, and therefore we need to preempt some of, some of that work." I mean, some of that's there already with speculative execution, but it, it hasn't all really come to, together. But Essentially, what you're saying, I, I hope that's exactly what happens. It's the, the details of making that work, I think, are going to be uh, a, a few years, in, well, a couple of years in the making, probably. Did, did that help? I, as, essentially, I, I agree. I, I think it's going to take a while to get that to work out well. Yeah. Another thing that's happening is closer to have. Hardware of different specs, so you can have SSDs on top of them. Yes. And then based on that, somehow, higher RAM, 
Yeah, so, so the comment is that nodes will have different specifications. Some will have SSDs, some may not have SSDs. Um, in, in our infrastructure, one of the main differentiators between nodes is, um, is the memory size on the nodes. So I guess the way I'll put it is heterogeneity happens. Um, Within our environment, we try to contain that and be very um, deliberate about when we're introducing change and, and why and how, but, but, it, but it just happens. Um, and so I, I think what's happening is the schedulers are, are starting to get smarter about dealing with, with, that, kind of, um, with, with that kind of heterogeneity. But it's 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 still not a simple problem. And it's, again, it's it, it does require careful management to make sure that, that it all works out. So you have the Fabes scheduler for the like, PM jobs. The yeah. Fabes scheduler. Right. So so, so it, right. So Subash's point is that there are, there are other schedulers. schedulers, but there there are pros and cons of these other these other schedulers. Yeah. But I I think that those work in in all of the different areas that needs to happen. Um, most of our customers are quite happy. Sorry, quite happy is not is a little bit too positive. Way to put it. They they have found a very functional way to work with the capacity scheduler with different groups of people and different priority, priority yeah. jobs that that they're running on their clusters, and and so that's working out pretty well. It's kind of at the margins. It's kind of at the two things. Kind of at the margins of that, or as we introduce these new kinds of systems. So that are one of the things uh, have they looked into, you know, using Arc or Parquet? Because I've seen tremendous performance just going putting the files into Arc or Parquet. Yes. So then um, now the now the question is getting into the different file formats. We've we've um, like Parquet and Orc. Um, I'm. I'm really happy to, so ORC is a column-oriented format. I'm really happy to see that. There are all kinds of great things you can do laying out your data in, in columns. And I think it was too long in coming getting that feature into Hadoop. But I'm, I'm really excited about seeing it. If for no other reason than when you lay your data out in columns, projections are essentially free. Right? So if you know what you're going to select in advance, um, or, or if you know you're going to select different groups of columns in advance, and lay them out in column-oriented format. That, that, that mm -hmm. essentially getting that could can almost be a metadata um, exercise. Have you benchmarked Park and Orc? Uh, have we benchmarked uh, Orc and Park? I, I, I. Okay, so I spent part uh, enough of my career in research and academia that I, I, I wouldn't say that we've done no, just proper one, benchmarking. Just one but, against the other but to see it, which one gets better performance. I, I know. Well, so so the question is better performance for what kind of jobs, right? Um, so certainly there are some kinds of jobs where where, where the data format will, will make a huge difference, right? But no, we have not gone in and specifically benchmarked. Or or to my knowledge, Akash, do you know? Do you know who we've done that? Maybe somebody at Altisdale has. Yeah, I am not aware. Uh, no, yeah. so one has kind of looked at it, but I don't know into what detail. Uh, but our customers, some of them are running all formats, and they have seen significant improvements in their in their high end test jobs. Yeah. Right. Because so, uh, so, uh, I, I have used it, and I have seen also really high performance gains. Right. Yeah. Just by going to work and yes. or parking. Yes. I've, I mean, I've seen actually uh, Orc has got better compression, slightly better compression. No, actually better compression than Parquet. Uh, slightly better performance, it's almost comparable. Yeah. But actually pa Parquet is more universally accepted. You find it more in more solutions. Park supports Parquet. Most of the tools out there now support Parquet more than Orc. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think Cloudera is one of the, like, if people are using Impala, they... they no, but I, it's, it's, it's more universal. I've been seeing all the tools, you find more parquet, but uh, Orc I've seen better compression right. and more performance. Uh, I mean, maybe because Orc was developed specifically for Hive, so you see that compression, uh, the better compression rates, and 
almost yeah. even even slightly better performance than Parquet, but yeah. uh, theoretically both of them give better performance. And uh, when you actually run the job, you'll actually see three to four times performance gains yeah. over what he was before. And then the, the the trick is, how can we get data scientists to express kind of the geometry of their data in a way that the underlying system can make these choices without and in general do a good job without having to be having data scientists get into the understanding of sure. okay uh, what exactly is the org format and parquet sure. format and how do they compare so sure, sure. Yeah. Uh, you want to ask some questions and give us this oh uh, um, yeah yeah sure um, uh, so, so okay. Here, here's one. Um, what are the units that Alta Scale sells? So, computer and storage. Computer and computer storage. storage. Computer and storage. And, and that's uh, uh, containers hours. Co container hours. And what was the other one? Uh, computer, computer and storage. Yeah, and then but what was storage? One. That was the easier one. <laughs> <laughs> Ten terabyte. Yeah, terabyte. I mean, yeah, okay. You need to figure out how to award this. I just promised that. Just throw it at me. Good enough. Good enough. Okay. Okay. Here, here's another one. What What was the um, What What was the technique that caused the um, uh, memory out of the out of memory error on the uh, hive client. Yeah, map side join. Did you come up with that? Okay. How many, how many more of those do you have? Do you have a couple, of, a couple of t-shirts? Uh, okay. So, what was the name of the, the sidecar of the hive meta store that allowed allows hive to talk to um, Tableau and Kettle and I I okay, that that one I guess was 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 too too <laughs> easy. Um, uh, okay, here's here, here's one. Um, what's the name of my colleague from? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and no, you don't get to answer. <laughs> no idea. I just I just said his name. I just said his name. Akash. Oh, oh, you're winning. <laughs> Who said it on this? Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, yeah. okay. I, I, I think you got it too. But said it. Um, uh, let's see. Um, on, on the title slide, I, I mentioned the uh, university that one of our employees got a uh, Cornell. Cornell. <laughs> Who said it was? Wow, you guys. So and so. This is this is. Pretty, uh, this is pretty impressive. Uh, uh, let, let's see. Maybe this one is too easy. We will do the t-shirts. Which, 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 which two companies have uh, collaborated a, a lot on Microsoft? <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that, was, that, was too, that was too easy. Um, uh, um, what, what's the name of the process um, that actually accepts the, so there's the application manager, and it talks to these other processes to say, run this task, tell me when it's done. Resource manager. Resource manager. No, that's, so the application manager asks the resource manager. And then he and then, but then the that's application the manager needs to talk to this topic. process. <laughs> that, <laughs> Huh? Task containers. They're task containers, but manager. what's the name of it? The yeah. node manager. Oh, node manager. Node manager. Yeah, it's managing the node. It's called the node. I don't get it. I already know it. <laughs> I, I know. Yeah. Well, it's a node manager. It's a node manager. You did. You should have got it. Oh, okay. Uh, how much money did RT scale raise in the last two months? It was out in the news. How much money RT scale raised? Twenty million. 
million dollars? One dollar. Million dollars. Sorry. Uh, no, what is that? Thirty million. That's what he said. Is it thirty? He also said. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's that's Dean. So Akash is here. Dean is uh, hiding over there in the corner. If you actually want to buy some. Some containers are stored. Dean's a talk to 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 talk to. Yeah, I guess asking the name of the company that's hosting us tonight probably. Oh, what's the name of a gracious host over here? Anyway, nice. No, that's a lot small. This is excellent. Yes, you are. Oh, here's one. What, what um, is the name of the pizzeria? Oh, uh, uh, pizzeria. You want small? Let's do small. You want small? That's all you got. Um, I know it's New York something. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, two more questions. Come on. See, see, this is this this is kind of stump too much of pressure. Stump the stump the stump the professor. Yeah. Speaker now. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> system. How's the multiple system? Yeah. How can any changes to the? Oh, okay. Akash, ask one question. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's a that's a good one. The, these things like this, this this <laughs> yarn dash blar yarn dash blar. Six four six nine. Yeah, but what 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 system? Did you write it? Right. Do you want a small or you want a book? Um, <laughs> <laughs> T-shirt. T-shirt? No, T-shirt. No. Okay, okay. So, so what, what was the... One more question. What was the cause of that hive job that just never terminated? <laughs> 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 What's the What's the bandwidth? How's the missing file? All right. Can ask them also what's the bandwidth between your data? Okay, we're done. No more prizes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Are we done? Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll stick around. Okay. I'll get some pizza myself. You can ask. You can stay and ask questions. Although I, I guess we need to be around by nine p.m. Or yeah. Like uh, you guys don't mind if you can just move the tables back here to the chairs. I mean, we're not quite at that.